Želim vam dobar dan. Dobrodošli na meni najdražu sesiju ove konferencije. Ovaj panel spaja dva moja posebna interesa. Jedan je nauka, drugi je nastava istorije. Moj lični angažman je, evo da kažem, podijeljen između ove dvije oblasti. I evo recimo da naša dva današnja gosta također spajaju ovo oboje. Ako govorimo o našem dragom Bobu Stradlingu, on je spojio nauku i nastavu. I nešto što je posebno važno na ovim našim prostorima, da to nije običajno, da se naučno obavimo nastavom. I ono što je Bob Stradling sa svojom knjigom kako predavati historiju Europe 20. stoljeća, napravi u regiji mi možemo slobodno nazvati recimo nekom vrstom revolucije. Ja sam podavno, ima ne znam nekih možda 7, 8 ili 10 godina napisao jedan tekst nastava historije na raskasnici misleći na vrijeme i društvene promjene koje su izazvale potrebu da mijenjamo naš pristup i naš odnos prema predavanju istorije. I jedna moja kolegica je rekla, pa baš si bio pametan u tom tekstu, a ja sam tu pamet pod navodnicima pokrao od Boba Stradlinga. Naravno, ja sam to isitirao uredno kako bih ostao na pravom putu istoričara, ali suštinski to promišljanje i promjena paradigme koju tada primjenjujem u svom odnosu prema historiji, zato krivicu nosi naš dragi Bog Stradlin. Također, naš drugi panelist, danas Steven Steger, naš prijatelj i kako je to Joke, prethodna predsjednica Juro Kleja jedne prilike rekla, naše mlade progresivne snage koje prihvataju ono pozitivno iz prošlosti organizacije Juro Klijo, Evropskog udruženja predavača istorije, koje u svojoj suštini jeste Evropsko udruženje predavača, ne europocentrično u smislu dominacije zapadne Evrope, nego upravo stvaranje jedne organizacije familije i porodice istoričara koji rade sa mladim generacijama. Kada smo rekli nove snage koje napređuju, i tu mislim, imamo tu još kolegu Jonathana i Stevena koje upravo idu u korak dalje od onoga što je doklio jeste. Jedan očigledan primjer promjene o kojima govorimo i promjena o kojima govorimo zadnjih 20-ta godina predstavlja i historijana. Ja neću govoriti o sadržaju. Par puta sam prisustvao prezentaciju i dijelova istorijani. Posljednji put u Ohridu naša draga Ineke je predstavila dio projekta na konkretnom primjeru, ali ću reći sigurno da je to doprinos najmanje dvostruk. Prvi je metodološki i metodički. Tu vam je lagan jalat koji pomaže svakodnevno nastavnicima, istraživačima i drugima. I druga njena vrijednost upravo jeste odmak od one evropocentričnosti u smislu samo dijela Evrope u našem pogledu na prošlost. Ja sam, ja ću ovdje stati, da ću riječ našim uvaženim gostima. Mislim da će Steven the first predstaviti i našu organizaciju, kažem našu jer mislim da ovdje još vidim lica koja su dio 
Iroklija i predstaviti aktivnosti koje Iroklija provodi u ispunjenju ne svoje misije, nego misije koje bi trebao da ima svaki predavač istorije. Da istorija ne razdvaja, nego da spaja. Da učimo dobro iz istorije, da učimo na greškama. Steven, molim te, ovo je tvoje vrijeme. Thank you very much, Aden, for the generous introduction. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Stephen. I'm now uh, the deputy director uh, of EuroCLIO, and I'm very happy to be here uh, amongst friends, amongst colleagues. Um, very happy that Bob uh, Stradling, the editor-in-chief of Historiana, also came here to present uh, together. Um, we are here for uh, the First World War. And the whole theme of the conference is to put the First World War in a wider perspective, regional approaches in a global context. And I think that we have a small contribution to that as well. And we're not only historians, we try to work together with history educators and bridge sort of the science with the classroom practice. Um, and Historiana was already introduced by Eden. Uh, it's a program in which we are working together with our members, uh, a community of professional volunteers from all across Europe and now increasingly the world, on the development of um, online resources for history education. Um, the target group are students in history and heritage aged 14 plus and their educators, but it's online, it's free, it's accessible, so in the end we think that also people generally interested in history will find uh, their way and hopefully learn and get inspired. The reason why we started this initiative is because a topic that was mentioned during several sessions. History education tend to be taught along very nationalistic lines and we wanted to offer an alternative to complement the national history teaching with an international perspective by providing sources, by providing uh, different historians' interpretations, and so on. Um, so that we can actually make a comparison between the history uh, in the different countries. So what are we trying to achieve? We want to go beyond the national approach, so a truly transnational approach. We want to encourage multi-perspectivity. It is something that we've been doing already for many, many years. But still, it's an obstacle, and there will be a whole session about multi-perspectivity. And we also want to encourage students to develop historical things, skills, to really think as a historian, to analyze like a historian, to form their own opinions, to analyze evidence, to argue, because history is a discipline and it has rules. And Bob will some, say something about these aim, aims later. And we felt that for encouraging multi-perspectivity and going beyond borders, a thematic approach was uh, suited. So Historiana as a whole focuses on several themes, such as conflict and cooperation, or ideas and ideologies, people on the move, and these are aims, uh, themes that you can very easily relate to. They're very clear and they're relevant on a local, on a national and on an international level. So, and there is lots of material already available, for example, on people on the move. We also, uh, next to presenting historical content, we started to collect sources. And this is an example of um, recruitment posters. So you can see just by one click you get examples from Australia, Britain, Germany, South Africa. And if you read them, I mean you can compare them because they all have the same aim. They needed to recruit new soldiers. But then the time can be different. In the beginning of the war there were very different messages than in the end of the war. And also between the countries there are very 
different strategies. So in Australia, it's one of my favorites, as it's nice in the surf, so really on the beach, but what about the men in the trenches? Go and help. And here, this British example, the one in the middle, why Britain is at war, fight for your country, fight for your honor, fight for your freedom, fight um, for humanity. So it's sort of, it's the just cause, it's the right thing to do. And in other um, examples, it's more about the threat that is coming. So the, the emphasis is different. Um, so, and for the glory of Ireland, for example, and then the, the woman is pressuring, um, will you go or must I? So in different ways you can compare these. So you can sort of see what is the message or what does it tell us about the realities in all these different countries. In some countries there are not really recruitment posters. Uh, the one in Austria is actually quite, uh, there are not many recruitment posters from Austria because there was no voluntary service, you just had to fight. So in countries where you actually had to volunteer to go to the army, people had to work much harder. Um, but then, one of the things that you get when you make a transnational collection is language. So we always say, well, it's, it takes so much time to get the sources, so we provide the sources. And then, well, but I can't read it. So we have a very simple tool that we're now working on. And this is an example of actually um, a war bond poster from France. And you translate it, and then you get the translation on top of it. So it's a very simple tool. It's no rocket science, but it solves a very practical problem. Um, the conference is about the First World War, and one of the first sort of big topics that we are focusing on is the First World War. It is partially in a reaction to the first the material which is now available on Historiana, which was very democratic. People focused on what they were interested in, what they found was missing. And when we got feedback, because we developed it together with history educators from the history educators, um, they said, well, it's very difficult to use it because the topics are very nice, but they don't appear in the curricula. So the First World War is a major topic in most school curricula. Um, and we thought it was very worthwhile to do something on this because there's no truly trans-border and multi-perspective approach. And I think what I've heard during this conference about the history teaching in the different countries gives further evidence of that. Um, so we want to have an approach where you can make connections and comparisons uh, across national borders, across military alliances. And I would like to invite Bob now to come here and introduce what we are making within the First World War module. Yeah, I'd like to thank Edin for the introduction as well. And uh, last time I was here was in the late 90s. So I got taken around by Serena yesterday to have a look. I'm very impressed with all the changes that are going on. Um, and look forward to coming back again. Um, before telling you something actually about the module, I should explain that we're describing today a work in progress. We hope that this module will be finished, ready to upload onto the Historiana website by the end of August. Uh, that's our deadline to work to. So some of the things I'll be just describing today are still being worked on. Um, and sometimes we're using a screenshot rather than showing you the whole of the thing because it's still not quite right yet. Here's the standard front page for Historiana. And these are the sections of the module. So the interconnected world, the world that was becoming increasingly inter interconnected by 1900. This was the context, if you like, for the developments leading up to the war. The descent into war, that period, the crises, the international crises leading up to this, uh, and then the actual uh, process that leads to 1914. Key moments in the war how the war was fought, and I'll come back and say something in a bit more detail about each of these. Experiencing the war, both men and women, uh, soldiers, civilians, how the war was reported, 
uh, across the world, glo a, a global look at that in terms of press. Um, report um, who was to blame. Uh, I must stress we're not offering a definitive answer to that question. What we want to do is to find ways of helping students to see that historians don't agree on this. And even a hundred years afterwards, we've still got a big debate about interpretation. And we are looking at, and we're going to ask you about this too, of looking at ways in which teachers could teach his interpretation, historical interpretation, in an effective way. And we have an example, that is one that we've been working on as well. The uncertain piece, yes, it didn't end in 1918, certainly not in Eastern Europe, certainly not in parts of the former Ottoman Empire. We need to reflect that and the longer term implications of what happened, the decisions being made in 1918-19. And finally, remembrance, remembering the war as well. So, whoop, what happened there? Ah, an interconnected world. All cousins, nephews, uh, or married to cousins, nephews, uh, and, and nieces, um, and still relatively powerful, big dynastic links uh, that influenced alliances and so on. The colonial world, the link between Europe and the colonies, still very important, growing during this period. The system of alliances, that subtle shift, but important shift from the old balance of power alliances to the military alliances that emerged, the defensive military alliances that emerged towards the end of the century. And of course, trade and communications, again, becoming much faster, much more effective, uh, linking the world much more quickly people on the move, migration, uh, people moving for trade, education, and so on. Money, very important here, the financial links that were developed, the way that banks were loaning money to other countries, governments were loaning money to other countries, creating links. And finally, ideas, these growing ideas that were influencing all of Europe at the time, like communism, like socialism, like nationalism, militarism, and so on. So that's what the interconnected world is about. This is the context leading up to the start of the war. The war begins. Oh, no. I'm not. Ah. I'm sorry about this. Descent into war. I've been pressing the wrong button. Um, I'll explain this in a moment. It probably looks very strange there. But, um, we thought about having a section on what caused the war. But actually we thought that Margaret Macmillan's question, why did the peace fail, was more interesting. Um, yes, we will look at all the various forces that were emerging at that time, such as nationalism and militarism, economic rivalry and so on. That's there. Uh, and so is the the role of certain individual countries and their aspirations and desires and individual agency. This is something that I think has come up several times in the discussions over the last two or three days. The importance still that individuals were making in terms of decision making and influencing others. Or, and I think perhaps equally important here, non-decision making uh, and, and the implications of that. So uh, that's there, but at the same time also, why did these institutions international processes and systems fail in 1914 when they've more or less worked with all the crises that have been building up to it. They've more or less worked with the Moroccan crisis. They've more or less worked with the Bosnian crisis, Balkan wars. Worked in the sense of not finishing up as a global war that was dragging in all of the great powers, but just stopping at escalate, the point of escalation. The trigger, of course, uh, the assassination here in Sarajevo, we're looking at that. Um, we thought a long time about how do you interest young students in something like that? Some old archduke, well, not that old, but who gets shot in a country they don't know, in a place they don't know, 100 years ago. How do you get them interested? So what we're working on at the moment, with the help of the young people that, who work for Stephen, is a CNN kind of presentation about the news, the immediacy of it, what's coming through. We've just heard that this has happened. 
what are the implications, how are people responding to this in Vienna, how are people responding to it in Paris and so on. Uh, so we'll see, we'll try it out on you at some point when we've finished it, see what you think. But of course also, the relevance of this, in a sense. Yep, as Carl Kasser said this morning, it had a big impact in Vienna when the news came through of the assassination. It had a bigger impact here in the region. The headlines, well, it hit the headlines in Paris and in London and in New York for a day or two. But then other stories took over very quickly. Um, and that's the one in Paris. It's the, uh, where Madame Caillot, wife of a French minister, uh, shot the editor of Le Figaro. Big sex scandal. I mean, what do you expect? It's France. Um, and I should point out, she actually got off. It was decided that it was a crime of passion. Um, only in France. But, uh, so, you know, and at the same time, a lot of ministers, a lot of generals went on holiday. And so did a lot of people. Here in July, you know, when all this is happening, and yet half of Europe is off on holiday. So there wasn't a sense that this local difficulty was going to turn into a global war. So that's what we're getting at here. Uh, the 37 days, yes, that period from the assassination to the declaration of war. And again, to try and interest students, we're looking at how we get them involved in the decision-making process of getting information, information from embassies. There are lots of telegrams available that we've been using. But what do you do when you get this piece of information that this has happened? Do you wake up the minister and tell him that the Archduke has been assassinated or not? Do you leave it to the next day? And what happens beyond that? And so a kind of decision-making game is being developed at the moment. I pressed the wrong button again, sorry. Uh, the war begins. Um, Yes, I'm using the arrows now. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's ridiculous because I have one of these as well. Uh, so this is an animated map. Uh, it would take too long to actually run it for you right now. But uh, first screen, 28th of July, 1914. Declaration of war by Austria against Serbia. End of the screen, 19th of July, 1918. The day after the last combatant country declared war, and this was Haiti, declaring war against the Central Powers. Um, and so what you get is a sense of how it starts in a particular area and gradually escalates until the United States comes in and then satellite countries around the United States come into the war as well. And what we try and do here is also have analytical questions coming up for the student to look at when it gets to a certain point. Why did Italy come into the war on the side of the Triple Alliance, uh, the Triple Entente instead of the Triple Alliance? Uh, why did Panama declare war on April the 7th, 1917? Okay, think about the canal, think about the nearness of the United States and so on. So it gets some thinking about this information and not just simply that it's a bit of information to remember. It's something about a process that's going on. Wrong right button. Uh, key moments in the war, how should we address that? And how can we do it in a comparative way? So that you get a sense, not just, as Stephen said, World War I is taught in so many countries, including my own, from a very local perspective. We look at the Western Front, and that's it, really. You know, and our students know absolutely nothing about what's going on in the Eastern Front. They know a bit about the Mediterranean. They do that because they know about Gallipoli. But they don't have a, a sense of what is going on across the whole process. So a, a multi-stranded timeline with the different theatres of war, Western Front, Eastern Front, Mediterranean and Southeast Europe, Africa and Asia, and so on. Now, we can present this in two ways when you look at it on screen. So you can look at it in this kind of linear, horizontal way, two dimensions, and you can just scroll along and get the information coming up that you might want. Or... I did the wrong one again. Uh, that's it. Or you can look at it in 3D. 
And so they're actually coming towards you. And I think one of the nice things about looking at it in 3D is you get a sense of what is happening elsewhere at the same time as the one that you're probably focusing on. So whichever theatre it is that you're looking at at the time, you get a sense of what is also happening alongside it. And I think one of the things about multi-perspectivity, we talk a lot about how different perspectives are focusing in on the same thing. But it's equally important that our students begin to understand the meanwhiles. This is happening here, but meanwhile, something else is happening which may or may not affect what you're looking at. And so this gives them an opportunity to get that data very quickly. How the war was fought. Now, I'm not actually that fond of lots of stuff on ammunition and weapons and the rest of it, but most 14-year-old boys are, so we do need to address this issue. Um, my grandson's 14, and he's totally fascinated by it. So we look at these sections, the war on land, war at sea, war in the air, the intelligence war, not just the spies, actually, but the reconnaissance war, the collecting of information, the building of maps, and so on. And perhaps, for me, the most interesting, the war of words, the propaganda war. Now, these are essentially uh, source collections that you can tap into and get information about. But there has to be a certain amount of narrative that ties that in. And that narrative really is showing how the nature of war changed between 1914 and 1918. There's, on the one hand, there's that shift from a war of movement, the Schlieffen Plan, this fast movement through Belgium into, into France and into northern France. But then there's the shift to the war of attrition, the trench warfare, the years of just fighting each other. And there are things there that I think our students need to know. Most of the students I've talked to assume that once you get in a trench, you're there for four years. You know, they haven't got that information that tells them that, on average, a soldier was in the trench for about 100 days a year. And the rest of the time, he was either trained, being retrained to do things, or it's rest and recreation behind the lines. So again, getting a sense of something which I'll come on to in a moment. But that, that narrative is also important here. So experiencing the war. Uh, again, looking at it from the perspective of the domestic perspective as well, the home front, the role of women there. Um, there were an incredible number of deaths in the munitions factories. I mean, the German factories, the French factories, the British factories. Uh, it was one of the most dangerous jobs you could do. Uh, and many women were crippled, killed, doing this. Again, it's something... You know, we tend to do, do it in our schools where we just have a picture like that. And isn't it wonderful? The women came and did the work. Uh, and then they went, at the end of 1918, they went back to being housewives again. I mean, the picture was much more complex than that. Um, and this is also an opportunity to look at life in the trenches. So we draw on uh, material postcards, postcards home, postcards to uh, soldiers and sailors, uh, Photographs, of course, diaries, letters. Uh, there's a lot of material we can access here. Uh, we have access to about 5, 000, 5 million uh, source, sources on 1914-18 through Europeana. Uh, and many of them are postcards where you can turn them around on screen and see what they actually wrote on them as well. Uh, and that's where the translation app is going to be very important. Reporting the war. Again... Not only the, the press and drawing on how the, the war was seen in different countries, including non competent countries, but we've got access to newsreels. We have access to about 600 hours of newsreels. Some of it is, is very difficult to use. I mean, the picture keeps going uh, and it's jerky, and, and really it was probably stock film that they never actually used. But some of it is really gold dust, it's brilliant stuff. Uh, and we're looking at how we can get students involved in using stock newsreel and editing it and putting a narrative to it uh, and getting a sense of understanding there of, of how this was perceived in Austria, this was perceived in Germany, this was perceived in Britain or France. And as I said earlier, the war doesn't stop in 1918. We've got to look at that as well. There is a timeline for this. Uh, we want to look at 
the continuing conflicts in Eastern Europe, Polish-Ukrainian conflict, Poland versus Russia, the, um, the Russian Revolution, the, the, the Russian Civil War, I should say, and also the internal conflicts, as in Germany with the Spartacus uprising and so forth. So that's all in there. Um, but also, what I think is important here is finding ways for students to relate then to now. Our decisions being taken in 1918, 1920 uh, are still working themselves out. I mean, every day they hear about Iraq, they hear about Libya, they hear about Syria. Uh, yeah, some of those tensions can be traced back then and they need to make the connections. I think one of the things that we feel very strongly about is not enough is done sometimes. And I'm not blaming teachers. I'm saying, I th actually, if I blame anything, it's curricula, history curricula. Packing so much in, in a short time, do, can you really expect that three years after that, they can make a connection between what they studied three years ago and what they're looking at now? You can help that, particularly using a website uh, where we've got the speed to get backwards and forwards in time to, in a sense, almost make them like time travelers. Um, also, of course, the aspirations for self-determination, looking at the national groupings in other countries, the ethnic minorities, but also a lot of groups went to the Paris Peace Conference who you might not have expected, and you don't tend to see reference to them in the, the school textbooks. A lot of suffragette groups from different countries went to the Paris Peace Conference, and their case was self-determination also involves universal suffrage. So, you know, these are elements we want to draw in as well. It, it's not a case of saying, here is a big narrative and you've got to go away and teach it. It's, here's all this material you can use if you're coming to look at a particular issue. And, of course, the Paris Peace Conference and looking at that and the implications of the decisions that needed to be made and the decisions that weren't made. Who was to blame? Well, as I've already said, we're not trying to offer a definitive answer here. I think a lot of history teachers tell us, and I understand why, that they're very nervous about the idea of dealing with historical interpretation. I think a lot of university lecturers are very nervous about dealing with historical interpretation as well. Uh, you know, and we tend to hide behind an authority on this one. And that's how a lot of our students think that's what history is. There is the big authority saying this is what the case is. Now, on World War I, it's very difficult because we've got so many historians who disagree very publicly with each other. And so we do need to find a way of addressing that, I think, of giving them a sense of there are reasons why historians disagree. There are even reasons why the same body of evidence can lead them to different conclusions. I also like the cartoon very much as well, but... Um, that's, that's from another of our collections. Um, and finally, Remembering the War. That's the beautiful Neue Wache by Kate Kolwitz in Berlin. But it isn't really just a lot of photographs of memorials, cemeteries, and so forth. I mean, there's some important issues here. The way we remember the war in most countries has changed since 1918. Uh, either it's incorporated subsequent conflicts or it's being perceived in a different way. And we need to look at the way, for example, film, novels, plays, uh, poetry, art, has reflected those changes in the way we, we remember the war. We also have, will have a film fairly soon in which um, a group of students have been to northern France and to Belgium to the memorial sites, and they've been interviewing people who come there and talking about why they've come and what it means to them still and comparing it with different generations as to how they think about the war. Is that you now, Stephen? Transfashion? Yeah, right. Okay. So you've now seen sort of the content that we're focusing on um, within the First World War module. So really from the beginning to the end, a, a comprehensive or at least a ba balanced package. Um, but I also mentioned three aims. And in this part of the, uh, the presentation, we will uh, give some examples of how we actually try to achieve those aims. 
And after this, we will have some active work because we also we realize that you have been sitting a lot and in the Eurocleo tradition, we always do that. Um, so I mentioned that uh, history is very often taught along the national line. The source collections are for us the prime way of helping and encouraging a uh, transnational approach. Um, the example that I will give is about propaganda. And propaganda has been used a lot in the First World War to justify uh, nations' involvement in the war, to boost morale, uh, to recruit soldiers. I gave the example before, to raise money, for example. Um, but also to influence the image of the other, more specifically, the enemy. And I will just quickly run you through some of the examples. And then you can also really see how you can easily link, take a national example, but also show how it's part of a bigger strategy. So the first example um, is a poster from uh, Germany. And it was made just before the negotiations um, about the armistice. So and it says what England wants. And it's sort of, um, so you can see the, the airplanes fighters going over and the destruction of industry. So they want to harm Germany economically. The middle one is in the beginning of the war and says, uh, it's a German example again, and says Ber Berliners protect your homes. So it's very clearly needed. The trap is coming from the enemy. Um, the third example is uh, the, another German example, and it's about the British use of churches as camouflage. So basically, the, um, the Germans were accusing the Brits of being cowards because the Germans would not bomb churches. So they would just go there and hide. After the armistice was signed, uh, this is an example from Britain, uh, there's this reference between sort of uh, a German as a soldier and then a German as a diplomat. It's a once a German, always a German. In Russia, um, they say the nightmares of Kaiser Wilhelm. And you can see him there with the, the typical headwear. And you can see that the Russian cavalry is sort of attacking Germany from the back. So it's really sort of they're afraid of us. Um, a German example um, in the end is you see the eagle from the USA looking at the British spider who is evolving more and more. It's the German eagle. It's the German eagle yeah. um, but drawing in more and more countries in the war. Just some more examples. So here you have a, a British example saying, questioning, is it the Red Cross or an Iron Cross? Basically blaming that the nurses from Germany were uh, not helping and um, were not doing really their job. So they left the Germans suffering. And you can see that she's German also because of the soldiers backing her. The middle example is from Germany claiming that the other allied, that the allied powers were actually more militaristic than they are, and they build it up with statistics. A French example says, has a German soldier sitting with a child uh, on his knee and say, laugh or I'll have you shot. Um, a Belgian example where death is standing next to uh, the German uh, emperor and saying, Philip, this is your work. And you sort of look for, on a valley of destruction. An Italian message uh, with quite a similar message where you sort of the whole uh, way in uh, of French and Belgian cities was paved with skulls. And the last example is um, from Germany and they say, okay, we will teach you how to run. And then you have all the different nationalities, their enemies. So it's always about the cruelty of others. It's sort of them as a threat. It's about 
the heroism of yourself. It's mostly, it's mostly blaming the others of cruelty, actually. But you can see that the same message is used in different countries. So you can sort of deconstruct that. Um, another example, uh, just to emphasize this approach, is uh, with official photographs. So we have a collection of official photographs made by war photographers from different combatant countries. And you can access them, you can make your selection, you can print them off, and um, you can look for similarities and dif differences. We actually also make now an online tool that you can use to make a comparison of several sources. And here you can see um, a German and a French example, both sort of boosting that they captured the weaponry of others. So they're fighting on different sides, but they use the same message. Here you have um, an Austrian and a German example, both central powers, about the, um, the leaders reviewing the troop. Everything is order. It's actually quite a reassuring message to home. Sort of look how good they all look. Look what leadership we have. And then there are uh, these, well, what we call post photographs, very often because the technology wasn't sophisticated enough. They have to sort of reenact the scene. And here you can see um, a German unit uh, in the trenches. I think quite relaxed, sort of laying back with a grenade. And it would be wonderful if fighting was actually like that. Nobody is injured. The uniforms are nice. And that's also what you see on the opposite side. So it's very, it looks like a very decent war, a French artillery unit. Um, the official photographs from Britain actually didn't have any dead soldiers from Britain because it was considered bad for the morale. In the opposite, dead enemies was very good for the morale, so you had a lot of those. And I've seen now a lot of these official photographs and then you can also sort of see the example of destruction. Sometimes sort of look we are winning, we destroyed this, or sometimes destruction and quite the opposite message, look at the brutalities and the things done to us. So it's, if you have a look at them, you can sort of see the messages, the themes are actually very common, across, and it doesn't matter who you're fighting for, it's just these official war photographers had similar assignments. Okay, um, Bob, can I invite you? to give an example for multi-perspectivity. And then, let me see. I'll just click it okay. to run the It's now running. Okay. Um, ah, can I just stop it? <laughs> um, Space. Yeah. Okay. Oh, um, we talk a lot about multi-perspectivity now. Uh, it's the buzzword, um, and uh, I'm to blame for some of that. Um, it's sometimes misunderstood, I think, that all you need to do is get a lot of source material, different sources, different perspectives, and then it's a bit like surveying. You're surveying a mountain. How big is the mountain? If you look at it from different perspectives, you get a better sense of its dimensions than if you only look at it from one perspective. So you get closer to the reality, an accurate picture. Now, yeah, that, sometimes that happens. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't happen. Sometimes all you get is a lot of different perspectives, a very confused picture. Now that's what historians have to work with. And, and students also need to understand that that it doesn't always get you to a nice, clear picture that we can all agree about as historians, as history teachers, and as students. So we've been looking about well, how can we approach that? What, what can we do to help students to begin to understand also the limitations? The limitations of primary sources, that they don't necessarily mean that because they're closer to what actually happened, that they can tell you what actually happened that sometimes is being able to gather them later and think about them as a historian might do 10, 20 years later to be able to reflect on the meaning of what they're looking at. So what we, sorry, Steve. So 
what we've got is just one example for you. It, it's elements of something that's a bit bigger. Uh, it's about the um, st so-called storming of the Winter Palace in Petrograd on 25th, 26th of October. So how do we know what actually happened? Well, we've got sources. We've got eyewitnesses. There were a lot of eyewitnesses to it. Some of them went on and put down their, their thoughts. We've got people who are collecting the records systematically, policemen, political leaders. We've got the propagandists, the filmmakers, and of course we've got the historians. But it isn't as easy as you'd think to find out exactly what happened. Let's take the eyewitnesses. Here we've got three journalists, American journalists. We've got some Red Guards, sailors from Kronstadt. We've got a resident. Here are the sailors come in. This is the version that they saw. They arrived at 9 p.m. They went into the palace at 11. And here's one person giving an account of what happened. But here is a resident, local resident, just 100 meters away from the palace. Writes down in his memories about it. He doesn't remember anything happening. It was one of the quieter nights as he just walked home. Here we've got Albert Reese Williams, an American journalist, as soon as he heard the firing from the Aurora, jumped in a taxi and got to the Winter Palace as quickly as he could. So he's talking about 11 o'clock as well. So this is three different accounts of what was happening at 11 o'clock. John Reed, an American journalist, if you read his book, he clearly has sympathies with the Bolshevik cause, friend of Lenin and Trotsky. Quite a dramatic image of what happened. He had been in the Smolny Institute, also jumped in a taxi and got there as quickly as he could. Bessie Beatty, another American journalist, was in the same car with him, standing almost next to him. A much calmer picture of what was going on, though. Uh, just the sound of crunching broken glass. Then we've got the people who are collecting, systematically collecting information. Trotsky, of course, number two at the time back at the Smolny Institute, gathering information, coming in from all sources. And on the whole, an account that many historians still use, to a large degree, query it a little bit, but still use it. Mary Buchanan, an interesting case here, she's the daughter of the British ambassador. She's watching what's going on out of the window of the embassy. Uh, so she, she hears the firing from the Aurora and from the, uh, the towers. She also sees what's going on in the streets. The interesting thing was she was st stood there while diplomats and military advisors are coming and giving her information. And, of course, Pavel Milyukov, a cadet leader, a leader of the cadet party, a conservative, says that a lot of terrible things happened to the women's battalion, quite the opposite of what Mario Buchanan had said. And finally, David Soskis. Uh, a Russian revolutionary had gone into exile in England in 1898, went back for the February Revolution to cover it as a journalist, and stayed there. And again, a very different account. More deaths, more, more injuries and wounded. And then we've got the Mythmaker account. Well, as you probably know, in 1920, on the third anniversary, Bolshevik government staged a big spectacle called the Storming of the Winter Palace, which finishes up with Kerensky running off down the street to a car, being chased by Red Guards. Um, that picture you find in a lot of textbooks as if it was what actually happened. 1926, of course, Sergei Eisenstein's film, October, funded again by, by the Bolshevik government. Um, actually, the account follows John Reed's account very closely and some of Trotsky's account as well. The thing was, the, dis the real disagreements were with the way he covered the storming of the palace. He was a filmmaker. He wanted it to be dramatic. It wasn't necessarily propaganda. And in two paintings, one on the left is American. You've got uh, cadets and red guards struggling. You've got looters in the background, a picture that the Americans saw. On the other one, it was in 1937, commissioned by Stalin, uh, and it was very much a revolution was taking place. Finally, the historians. Here we've got Richard Pipes, Polish-American historian, very much a Cold War historian of the time. This isn't a revolution that's taken place, it's a coup d'etat. And the evidence for that, well, nobody was fighting. It was quiet. Sheila Fitzpatrick, an Australian, who went to the University of Texas, got a very rough time from American historians 
for her account. Yes, she talks about a coup, but she says that by this time, basically, the provisional government had given up. Uh, and that, indeed, there was a revolutionary mood amongst the working class throughout the whole of 1917 that was reflected in the choice of the Bolsheviks as their party. Roy Medvedev, Russian historian, expelled from the Communist Party for his views on Stalin, um, now a strong supporter of Putin, uh, here again, 15 dead, round 60 wounded. It's a slightly more violent account than some of the others. British historian Norman Stone, uh, again writing around the time of the end of the Cold War, saying there was no opposition and just six fatalities. Last one, Orlando Figus. His account is quite similar to Trotsky's, interestingly enough. Um, but saying, you know, yes, there were a lot of people milling around in, in the palace square, uh, but there wasn't much actual physical violence taking place. So what do we make of this? Well, I think there's two lessons here about the process of history for students. One is that sometimes the primary sources do not in the end tell you exactly what happened. It's a question you can't answer, and you should settle for that. What you can say is some of the things people seem to be relatively agreed about and there are other things that they disagree about. But I think there's a bigger lesson here about history and, and the process of history, which is about the fact that there is still a debate amongst historians about the meaning of this. It's not about the evidence, it's about the meaning of it. Uh, on the whole, they're using the same evidence. Sheila Fitzpatrick, one of the generation that was able to go into the archives after 1990-91, still says there wasn't a lot of extra evidence that she could draw on to talk about what happened in terms of that night, uh, but plenty of evidence about the revolutionary feelings amongst the working class in Petrograd, in Moscow, and so forth. Um, so, um, I mean, a message coming through from that is historians with access to the same evidence are either coming to different conclusions or they're selecting the evidence that suits their conclusions from that body of evidence. And that's part of the historical process, because in the end, it isn't just about evidence, it's about the political perspective and the methodology of each of the historians. And this too is something that we need to find practical ways of conveying to our students. Stephen will do most of the talking about developing historical skills, and we want to get you doing a bit of a workshop activity around this in a minute as well. Um, but I think one of the things I've been stressing all along is how we help students make connections. How they make a connection between one thing that's happening and another thing that's happening, or they put it into a bigger time perspective. They understand the longer term that's happening, that what was happening at that time has influenced what is now happening or that influenced what was happening in Europe over the next 20, 30 years. Um, so this one is on just a simple animated map again of border changes in Poland. It could have been about Palestine, it could have been about Ukraine. Uh, plenty of opportunities to look at how things changed over a period of time. So what we've got here is the map of the Second Polish Republic after the Great Uprising in the Poznan uh, province. Um, and this is the, the, the boundary or the border at that moment, April, end of April 1920. We see that by that time, the initial advance of the Red Army has been stopped, has been a counteroffensive by Polish forces, and they've moved the border that far. But by May 1920, things have changed. The Red Army is becoming successful uh, against the Whites in the, in the Civil War. There's the peace treaties with Latvia and Estonia. There's an all-out war now that Lenin has called for. Massive push. Then, of course, you get the miracle of the Vistula and the battle for Warsaw. And again, the push back. I think one of the interesting things there, which I've gone so fast that it probably doesn't come through, but when the Red Army, five armies, pushed the Polish forces back, they were traveling at 30 kilometers a day. 
It's quite astonishing. Uh, even Napoleon would have been proud of that. Um, when the Polish forces pushed the Red Army back, they were traveling at 30 kilometers a day as well. You know, so it was a, quite a remarkable period. Um, and in a way, the maps convey the, those changes. Now, we could have started that sequence of maps in the 18th century with the, parti the first partition of Poland. And we could go right through to 1945. Uh, it's just that that was trying to give you a quick sense of what we're, we're looking at. And of course, as you can think, we could have done that with Palestine from 1918 right through to today. I think that's me to you now. Is it? Um, oh, sorry, yes. What we also try and do with these kinds of activities is to have an analytical question coming up at the end to get the students to think. In this case, it was why do you think the British historian A.J.P. Taylor, writing about the Battle of Warsaw and the Polish victory, said it largely determined the course of European history for the next 20 years or so. Has to do quite a bit of thinking about. But some of these activities work very well towards the end of a module or a unit on something like the end of the First World War or like the Eastern Front Wars uh, because it gets them to use the information that they've been studying to start thinking analytically about the meaning of it. Okay. So the last example that we will give before, I guess, taking some questions and then doing the, the workshop activity is um, one of the tools that we are making. Um, actually, it's like on, online methodologies that you can use. And what I like about it is that it also solves the language issue because this is what you can make yourself um, in your own language. So, and it's uh, very simple activities that you can actually, if you have a good idea, you can make it in two or three minutes. So you're now looking at this from uh, the perspective of a student. So you are, have been the educator who designed this learning activity. And it's about the analysis of a visual source as a historian. So here you get First, you can put an introduction. So you provide the information to the student that he or she needs to know to uh, do the assignment. So in this case, you get a bit of information about the photograph. So you see a busy factory floor at the National Filling Factory in England during the First World War. Like the other photograph you saw, this was where the bombs were made. So millions of bombs were um, filled with high explosives to be used in the Western Front. So then at least students know what the, they're looking for. Then the assignment comes. And the assignment is about the different roles of the people in the picture. And students are asked to look at the picture and explain what the people are doing. And what does it tell you about the different roles at the factory? And they're asked to select the clues those parts of the picture that help them to answer the, the question. So now I've been asked, and I sort of, I fill it in. And the first thing that I noticed as a student is this man was standing. So and I say, well, this man is dressed in a suit. He's overseeing the work floor. Okay. So then you can sort of see the annotation is added, and you have a legend that appears. But my assignment isn't finished. I have to look at different people. So, and here I can see, well, checking the shells. So, this woman, like dressed in a uniform, she checks the bomb shells, and it appears to be dangerous work. Afterwards, you actually can see the day, uh, like uh, that there's no smoking, and there's danger, no fire, and some safety equipment. And then I look here, and this woman is driving a trolley, and she's carrying the shells. And you can see that there are the, the trolley has, even though it's on a track, has rubber tires. So, and it could be to prevent the sparks to actually set off the explosives. 
So, so far I then identified one man who was overseeing the work and I see that it's dangerous work and I see that the women are actually doing the work. So that tells a lesson about the gender division. And it's actually, it was quite remarkable that in that time the women were doing so much of the work. And then, so actually by looking at it as a historian, you can sort of say, okay, this is what I learned by the roles and the exercises help them to look as a historian. So after filling in the assignment, students can also, they can submit and they can see what their colleagues have been doing, the other students. So you have the option as a teacher to put your own answer, but I think it's also nice to compare. And especially with more complicated assignments, um, you can do that. We're now discussing within the team what are the different ways of using it, because you can uh, also instruct students to formulate questions, or you can have perhaps an infograph and sort of, can you explain what you know, what else you know? about this and then you can sort of get all the knowledge from the different students out out of the group we have another example where we say okay first look from one perspective then look from another perspective so there are different ways of using the tool and in the coming year we will sort of pilot this and try out and improve the teacher's guide um, so far the presentation about uh, the sources. I'm not sure if you have any questions in at this stage. Or yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe. Maybe. Why I'm speaking in English <laughs> after Bosnian opening of the session? I'm going to return to Bosnian language. It's easier, especially at the la last part of the day. Nadam se da su vaše bilježice pune kao što je moja za ovaj dio koji smo do sada čuli. Ja sam zabilježio nekoliko crtica šta nam se pruža ovaj portal. Sadržaj i raznovrsni nastavni materijal. Multiperspektivnost. Vidimo historiju ljudi. Ponuđene metodološke obrazce. Jednostavan pristup i pored nekih tehničkih sitnih problema. I mnogo toga. Na početku konferencije je otvoreno pitanje zbog čega smo se okupili na konferenciji. Počesto se i postavljamo pitanje zbog čega radimo ovaj posao. Istražujemo, pišemo koji je krajnji cilj i šta je rezultat našeg rada. Bar u regionu, a čini mi se još uvijek u Evropi, postoji jaz između naučnika koji istražuju prošlost i usnovno rečeno njihove nebrige šta ćemo dalje s tim, zbog čega smo nešto otkrili i neke dugoročne stvarne koristi. U zahval vama koji ste došli, očekivao sam i više ljudi koji učestvuju na konferenciji, koji istražuju i koje bi evo recimo trebali da se brinu šta s tim što smo istražili i spoznali o prošlosti ja se najdam da ono što smo čuli u kratkoj prezentaciji koja sigurno bi zaslužila i cijelodnevnu aktivnost kroz radionice pored prezentacije da bi smo malo dublje ušli u sam materijal koji je ovdje pred nama ali mislim da je ovo dovoljno da vidimo koja je to korist otvoreno je pitanje zbog čega neko je rekao negdje u prolazu kako da popravimo svijet ono što imaju mogućnost nastavnici istorije 
da sistemski ispred sebe imaju budeće generacije. Ja mislim da pravilnim pristupom podučavanju istorije oduzimamo oružje regresivnim snagama. Ako budemo ovako pristupali, kako ja razumijevam, podučavanju mladih generacija, stvorit ćemo generacije slobodno mislećih ljudi. Multiperspektivnost se polako poča da, kako mi tu Bosni kažemo, izlizuje zbog česte upotrebe, a često ljudi ne razmišljaju šta to znači. I ono što nam je Bog pokazao na jednom primjeru, šta to znači, jeste stvarna priprema budućih generacija da misli. I ako bih ja odgovarao kako, zbog čega radimo i zbog čega smo na konferenciji i zbog čega radimo inače na posao, ja bih rekao to u nekakvu duhu Iroklija znanjem i vještinom do boljega svijeta. Pri čemu znanje nije memorisanje činjenica. To je nešto iza i to je mnogo jače i mislim da je ovo put kako sam je ovdje zabilježio kako totalna istorija, bolje reći istorija ljudi, humana istorija može nadladati nacionalističku i nacionalnu. Da historija ne bude naša versus vaša historija. Kao što sam rekao, vjerujem da su i vaše blježnice pune i da imate ideja, da iskoriste priliku što imamo tu i Boba i Stivena. Vjerujem da ovo nije prva, odnosno posljedna prezentacija istorijane u Bosni i Hercegovini. Naćemo nekako načina da se fokusiramo na nastavnike, ali evo ovdje u ovom uslovu rečeno više naučnom miljevu, da iskoristimo njevo pristupo da otvorimo neka od ovih ili krupnih konceptualnih pitanja ili nekih teničkih pitanja kako doći do informacija, kako iskoristiti ono što imamo, evo čuli smo ubrzo će doći i otprilike kraj i da će se kompletirati projekat pa će biti dostupan u svom punom kapacitetu. Molim vas pitanja, komentari. Mikrofon u vas. Hello, it was really interesting and exciting and I would like to ask you what is your opinion, experiences for example in Western Europe in the most so-called developed countries and the most developed historiographies regarding the teaching of the Great War. For example, I have the impression that here uh, on the Balkans uh, we, we, uh, we tend to, to understand that we have problems with this interpretation of the war and so on but for example when uh, Boris Johnson, the, the London mayor recently uh, said that uh, his, uh, I'm paraphrasing but I think I'll catch the, the essence that he's sick of this uh, multi-truth and that he knows who won the war and so on and uh, so, so this is not this uh, typical Balkan misunderstanding but it's I think more serious because we, we hear it from him so, so could you just comment this and Ja se izvinjam, molim vas samo i predstavite se zbog kolega da zbog bolje komunikacije Daniel, I'm from Belgrade Daniel Šarjanec Yes, Boris Johnson knows better but uh, his electioneering. Um, we do have a debate at the moment going on about how we teach First World War in British schools. I have to say I live in Scotland, so I'm quite fortunate that I, do, I don't have to answer to the English education minister. Uh, um, Scotland is quite fortunate because the man was born in Scotland, but he chose to go and work in England. Um, but. The dilemma is that with the commemoration coming up uh, this year, and then I suspect we're going to get four years of commemoration right through to 2018, you know, the message coming from politicians is that this is something to celebrate. And so there has to be a villain, there has to be a smoking gun, and it's Germany. Um, now, it's also true that we do have one or two historians, Richard Evans, has said it's Serbia. Um, Sean McMeekin, the uh, American uh, historian, says it's Russia, uh, with collusion from France. Um, 
Niall Ferguson said it's Britain because we actually joined in. Um, he, this is one of the most amazing uh, interpretations I've ever come across, where he argues that um, had Britain not joined the war, Germany would have won it very quickly, and they would have introduced a European Union in the 1920s rather than more recently. So, I mean, there's a lot of bizarre commentary going on at the moment, and I think one of the dangers is that historians are becoming celebrities in, in Western Europe, uh, and therefore they're, they're saying things that they would never say to their students. Um, they're very eager to get onto television uh, and talk about these things. Uh, well, generally, what I do fear is that we're teaching in Western Europe now a much more national history than we ever did before. Uh, there is less comparative work. There is less multi-perspectivity. Um, and this is certainly the case in Britain that they want a national narrative of the 20th century. And it's going to be a victorious narrative. Uh, so I am very disturbed at the moment at some of the developments. Uh, in my own country, Scotland, I work very hard with colleagues to try and avoid that. But you see, we, and I know you here in, in Bosnia are coming up to a stage when you're going to, to have discussions about a new curriculum. Um, and I got some interesting information from Serena yesterday about that. Um, we had in Scotland a thematic approach, but there's a feeling, as you know, we've got a referendum coming up about independence from the United Kingdom, and so there's a feeling we need more national history, that not enough young people know their Scottish history. And there's a fundamental issue here. Do you really affect people's identity in 50 minutes of history a week for four years? particularly in some countries where it's not even mandatory, where it, you know, it is not a compulsory subject. So you know, there's a lot expected of history by politicians, that it creates citizens, it creates good Britons or good Bosnians. Or good, you know, we need to be a bit more realistic, and so do they. What we really want to do in the end is give them some sense of how do we get to here from somewhere else, not even where do we come from, which I think is one of the dangerous questions that when I first started doing this kind of work, you know, worried me about parts of Eastern Europe, certainly after 1989, you know, that there was a big sense of we need more nationalistic history and not just national history. But the important question is, how have we become what we are? And that's what they need to understand. And I want to pick up from Edin about the need for challenging, need to teach them how to ask challenging questions. Ernest Hemingway said we need to give everyone a built-in crap detector. And I think that would be a very good objective that we should be writing down on new history curricula, that one of our aims and objectives is to help young people to have a built-in crap detector, to recognize when they're being lied to, to recognize when people like Boris Johnson are using the media to make a point in order to win an election rather than to actually make a statement about history. It's a long answer, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll contrast that with a very short answer. <laughs> um, what you see in the country, basically all across Europe, is that there is now more and more attention for the First World War because of the centennial. Um, but there is a very strong focus on how did the World War War, uh, First World War affect us. So in the Netherlands, it's not such a big issue as the Second World War because we were neutral and not so much involved in as the other countries. Um, the bigger thing is how much emphasis is put on knowledge and sort of the debate about skills and knowledge. Um, in a lot of countries like the Netherlands, there is much more emphasis on how do you apply historical knowledge so it's sort of a combination of skills and knowledge. You need them both. Um, but I don't think there is any country where the history of the First World War is truly taught from a transnational, um, multi-perspective approach. And sometimes if you sort of say, well, we have two or three lessons about it, but there's not a lot of room. So I, I agree with your earlier statement that it's really the curricula. Do you allow for first building knowledge and then really applying it 
have critical questions allow students to form their own opinions. So it's Imamo li još pitanja za ovaj dio prezentacije koju smo sada čuli? Ja sam Sedat Bršli, ja dolazim iz instituta za historiju u Sarajevu. Prvo čestitam na izlaganjima koja su zaista bila ovako inspirirajuća, posebno ovdje u Bosni i na Balkanu gdje Ipak malo zaostajemo u ovim tehnologijama i načinima korištenja svih tih mogućnosti u nastavi. Međutim, ja bih ovdje se obratio na sljedeći način. Evo, pratim tri dana konferenciju i želim čestitati svom profesoru, doktoru Radušiću, koji je po meni spomenuo ključno pitanje ili ključnu stvar vezano kako za ovu konferenciju, tako i za historiografiju općenito na svjetskom nivou. Dakle, zbog čega smo mi tu i zbog čega mi organizujemo ovakve konferencije i slična pitanja. Kod nas je historija kao nauka disciplina koja se svrstava u humanističke nauke. Moj lični onako kako bi kazao utisak u dosadašnjem dijelu konferencije jeste da se malo istakla ta humanistička dimenzija. Dakle, pitanje je koliko mi historiju otvaramo, historiografska pitanja koja će biti sama sebi svrha i to je ovo pitanje koje je potencirao i dr. Radušić. Dakle, zbog čega mi sve te detalje istražujemo? A koliko želimo iz svih tih pitanja izvući nešto više, neku veću poentu iz svega toga. A ako govorimo o humanizmu, onda nedvojbeno je tu pitanje između dobra i zla. Ja, nažalost, nisam do sadašnjem dijelu konferencije vidio ni čuo da se je dovoljno potenciralo pitanje zla, jer govorimo o ratu. Govorimo o mračnom 20. stoljeću istorije Evrope i o milionima mrtvih. Iako smo prije toga možda imali imperije stotinama godina sa manje žrtava. Nažalost, sinoćna debata oko Sarajevskog atentata, iako taj termin ne volim, za mene nije Sarajevski atentat, nego je atentat na Franca Ferdinanda, mislim da je malo nepristojno cijeli naziv jednog grada ulačiti u ime atentata. Nisu zaslužili svi ti građani tadašnji, ali ipak se radilo o jednoj šačici ljudi koja su izvele to. Ali nije se dovoljno potenciralo zlo. Da se kaže da je to zlo. Zbog čega? Zbog budućnosti. Jer kako ćemo graditi pomirenje? Kako ćemo naučiti ljude da misle? Kako će razlikovati dobro od zla ako ne kažemo za taj događaj iz 914. a posebno kada imamo u vidu šta se je desilo u zadnjih sto godina u istom tom gradu i na istom kontinentu, da je to zlo. I konkretno za vas pitanje, možda se može povezati u vezi s tim, malo čas ste spominjali kako kada ste objašnjavali sve te detalje i događaje iz prvog svjetskog rata i na koji način ih prezentujete studentima, tu multiperspektivnost, i onda ste u jednom trenutku kazali to je važno da studenti znaju zato što i danas imamo ratove u Iraku i Siriji i tako dalje, da bi bile... E ja vas sad, ja vam želim postaviti sljedeće pitanje. Koji je vaš smisao iz evropske perspektive da studenti to znaju? Je li samo zato da bi im rat bio dio identiteta u životu i danas dok žive, da se naviknu na to u svjetskom kontekstu ili to ima neke više ciljeve? Da se oni malo odrede sprem toga na koji način trebaju da imaju percepciju sprem rata i to krvo prolića koji se dešava, je li, vrlo brutalno u zadnje stoljeća i dan danas. Hvala. Hvala na obzorvaciji i na pitanjima. Ja ću iskoristiti 
Evo vaš uvod da postavim pitanje kako Juro Klio i kako konkretno istorijana tretira pitanja dobra i zla. Da li otvaraju se ta pitanja i kako se mi odnosimo prema tim, evo recimo, ključnim vanvremenskim pitanjima pravde i pravednosti, dobra i zla i kako to da predstavimo mlađim generacijama. Molim vas, to je fakt će izlučeno ono što je govorio kolega Sedad kao prvo pitanje, a drugo pitanje je i bilo direktno upućeno. A very difficult, sorry, a very difficult question to answer, I think, or both of your questions, really. Um, I feel that when we deal with the enormity of something like a world war uh, or a holocaust, the numbers are not really helpful. It's difficult to see what students make of six million people die or 20 million people died or... 20 million people died from Spanish flu in 1918-19. You know, it's so enormous that it, in a sense, leaves them almost brutalized because there's not much that they can make sense of. Now, in terms of the Holocaust, for example, and if I just use that because I started that process, but it's got me thinking that way, um, it has always been a problem. We teach it... Uh, it's a required subject, uh, a topic, rather, in our curriculum, our history curriculum, the, the Holocaust. And sometimes it does seem to dwell on just the sheer numbers. And, yes, they write their essays, and they put all the information in that they need to, but I don't think it touches them. And one of the most effective approaches to the Holocaust that I ever saw was where they looked at life in the Warsaw Ghetto and there were some photographs photographs that had been taken illegally by German soldiers uh, who would have been shot had they been caught with these photographs and one that was used for discussion showed five or six elderly men, men about my age and I'm obsessed with books as well, there was a library out in the street, just a table like this with old books on it and they were all stood there looking at the books and talking about the books. And behind them in the gutter was a child dying. Now, what do you think about that? You think, on the one hand, this is terrible. How could men do that? But on the other hand, and the way in which the teacher was working with that, was that showed how even in the middle of something as dreadful as this, of living in a ghetto constantly under threat, humanity carried on. People still read books. People still carried on in family life. And I think we miss that sometimes when we deal with wars. History has so many wars in it, and our curriculum often has so many wars in it. But you know, so the youngsters, I use the word brutalized, but you go from one war to the next war. Look at the 20th century. That's how we teach it so often. You're just dealing with conflicts all the way through. Uh, and unless you look at the humanity within that, now, I don't know whether it is our job to be teaching what is right and what is wrong, but I think it is our job to be giving them the skills, the analytical thinking that enables them to work that out for themselves. And I think you can only do that by also focusing on humanity and the human aspects of history. Uh, it's, it's what it was like for people at the time living through this, not who won it or who lost, who had the more soldiers and so on. Yeah, again, I'll, I'll just have a, a short reply. Well, when you teach history, it's, you always make choices. The content that you address, the sources that you select, the things you emphasize, the questions you ask. So, in a way, that always reflects the values of yourself. Um, so there's no like hard line between citizenship education, or civic education, and history education. It, it's sort of blurred. And what we try to do in our work is to make history educators aware of that. And to sort of say, like, if you make selection, if you do a certain approach, that has a value behind it. And as much as possible, encourage 
independent and critical thinking. Um, and within a topic like the First World War, to emphasize something so you can focus on conscientious objectors, for example, um, or frame things in a, con in a way that is relevant for the here and now. Uh, in chemical warfare started. There, there, there are examples of um, the use of, of mustard gas. Well, that is very easy to link to debates we have today about the use of chemical weapons. So then you sort of show, um, and you, um, we focus on some of the dilemmas and human rights issues. Actually, one of the themes for Historiana is rights and responsibilities. And there you can also sometimes just show that rights clash and then encourage debate about it. So I think it's sort of how do, how do you create a learning environment and within that really encourage students um, to discuss. And within that, because the classroom environment, how you manage that, we also have values. We do want to have equality. We do want to have dignity. We, there are certain things that we don't uh, allow. Hvala, imamo još jedno pitanje za sada. Well, it was more actually, uh, yeah. Carsten Dede was from Copenhagen. It was more actually uh, an attempt to address this question raised because we have a consensus on individual human rights. We have international conventions. We have some ideas of what is good and what is bad. And uh, that is something we should, of course, be communicated to the students. But one of the problems is that if we stay with structures and not look at individuals, these um, concepts disappear, actually. What moved me today the most was the story about a, an Austrian Hauptmann who treated um, Serbian women in a horrible way and, uh, and raped and executed them and was proud of it. And here you have personalized the hate which was cultivated with the Austrian troops in the war in 1914-15 against the Serbian civil population. There's no doubt that that is evil. Uh, that is what we would condemn as crimes against humanity or even worse. Uh, it, it borders a genocide. So we have the definitions actually. But what moves you is when you have the personal description and, and here you come close at people, you can identify with it. And I think one of the values of visual or the visual material, that is that you can come close to the recorded reality. And in this way, make it touch you and make you understand something about good and evil. Well, that was just my little comment on that. Thank you. E, Senada, ja molim da e, pitanje ostavimo za kraj prezentacije. It's time for workshop activity and later on at the end we can open another set of questions. Okay. We'll take the two questions and then we'll start no, 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 If questions are, let's say, more uh, conceptual, we can no, no, leave them for the end of the presentation. Okay. 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 Steven, please. Just a, it's just a quick one, and I wasn't here long enough the whole time, so I, I have to be careful. But um, it seems to me that we have to be careful about the labels we use. When you say, it's interesting, and don't get me it wrong now, it's interesting that we heard a, a, a lecture today about an Austrian officer that raped Serbian women which may be the case. He was an Austrian and he was in the Austrian army. But we, are, we have to be very careful about, about these labels. In other words, they, they, will, they, will, they conjure and they can be misused and they can be misinterpreted. And in, a, in societies that are most deeply racist, and those are most of our, our um, uh, Western societies, it's very difficult when you have an interaction between the parents and the children and the things that you are teaching. The, um, the children in the way of history. And so it's, it's, 
the, you have your your if you're stru do, teaching structurally, then you can you can uh, can use labels that are are abstract. But as soon as you start using very personal, very um, direct examples, you can you have to be very careful about the way they're 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 presented, because they can be taken incorrectly or be misused or misunderstood. That's all I was I was saying. It's not a critic. It's just that, that it's, I think it's, uh, I, it can be a problem. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, as soon as you categorize or when you label. Um, you are at risk of stereotyping um, or implying more than, than you meant. I mean, I'm not sure if in this case, um, I don't know enough about the story to see if the labeling was justified or not. But I think in your teaching, it's much more important that students realize this as well, that when they read the text, that they can see the labels and sort of read between the lines. Um, because then you become, it's also media literacy sort of if you hear the news, if you open a newspaper, uh, or that you're more aware of your own language. So I think it's an important point. But um, on the other hand, you also need to make sense of what happened. You need to make it accessible. So that's always, yeah, you have to find a balance, I guess. I, I come back, though, to what are we doing as history educators? And it seems to me we are trying to help them to be analytical and to ask the right questions. Uh, now, as educators, we may also be trying to teach them the difference between right and wrong, and we also have civics, and we look at human rights. Um, although, again, I think some of the best human rights education I've seen does recognize that there are issues and dilemmas between rights. Uh, your own country in particular with the Mohammedan uh, cartoons for example, which rights are universal here, and so forth. So, I mean, those are issues that, as educators, we should be helping our students to work their way through. And I used an example of Pavel Milyukov uh, saying that the women's battalion who were defending the, the Winter Palace were raped, executed, and so forth. What we want from our students is to say, is that true? How do I know that? What evidence do I have? What evidence is available to back that up? And when you start looking at the evidence, he didn't present any. It was a statement. It was a political statement. He was negative. He was anti-Bolshevik. It was a good moment to throw in something that would frighten people. Ironically, he didn't write it till the early 20s when there was evidence that that wasn't the case, even from people who had been in the women's battalion. So, you know, our approach here is part of being studying history is to inquire and, and to ask inquiring, challenging questions. So, yes, there are these elements that require us as educators to worry about humanity and human rights and right and wrong and morality. But there are also elements about if you're studying history, these are the kinds of questions you should be asking. And I propose we go to the, the it's active time to part. workshop activities. Yes, exactly. Yeah, please. Um, so perhaps if we make um, groups of, let's say, four, four people, and then uh, make sure you have a common language, and the people who, have, um, who actually need translation, because we only prepared the material in English, we have two interpreters. I would invite you also to come out and to join the group. Um, so we can have two groups um, where tra translation is provided and for the other groups uh, it will be in English. So please find four people for one group. Interactivity is part of your clear idea. We should show how it works.
So the exercise is actually, um, well, it's also on screen. Ah, yes, sorry. So what you can see here is a, a very, um, like a, an activity where you can see two satirical maps. They're both produced by uh, British cartographers. And this was actually quite common. On Historiana, you will also have examples from Germany, from France, from Russia. But the interesting thing about these pairs is that both were used as propaganda posters first in Britain, and later they were reproduced in Germany and again used for propaganda. Um, so the question is to first look at it from a British perspective and to discuss what would be effective in terms of propaganda for persuading the British public to, to support the war effort. And then once you have done, discussed that, um, to look at it from a German perspective and why a German government might think this would be good propaganda for pers persuading a German public. So that is the activity, and if you can discuss for five minutes, perhaps we can get some ideas from the group.
Okay. So, thank you very much um, for for discussing and actively participating. Um, we actually, so we have more activity um, like this. I hope it, it showed a little bit like what you can do with the sources and it, clearly it provoked you because you were actively discussing. Um, there's one part that I would, um, that we still pr propose and even though it's late I would still like to show it and just get some of your feedback. Um, and it is about who was to blame. And, and Bob, if you would like to introduce okay. this one. I must say, I would like a little bit of feedback from you about the activity you've just done first. You know, what did you conclude? Can we just have a very quick comment from each group? Okay. Uh, this group? A bit Otherwise, I've done it from my things. Okay. We conclude that uh, both pictures can be used in many ways for uh, that's for the first thing to do, and that uh, this picture actually uh, explain why Britain wanted to be in the war and why should she? Because, for example, uh, both of the pictures saying that there is one evil that we need to solve, and that is Germany. And the first, uh, she is represented as a dog that is scared, and that they don't actually need too much force to deal with that, but they were wrong. And the other, the whole Europe actually, um, the symbols of Europe, actually more symbols of people, because there is no soldier. People wants to resolve the problem. So they are going to make a soup of this chicken <laughs> or this bird. Uh, on the other eagle. hand, yeah. Yeah, eagle, of course, I know. But uh, from the German side, uh, we fear, we are very in fear, so we need to do something. Uh, of course, you don't. <laughs> there is a reason because you can um, interpret it. You can interpret it in many, many, many ways. And um, from the uh, from the other side, we were uh, watching at Scandinavia and Spain. They were actually like in theater, just watching and doing nothing. So who actually is to blame? The one who is want to do something or the one who doesn't do anything? Interesting point, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, I believe that, that uh, Britain has an impressive, like, May I speak in Bosnian? It's a bit yeah, easier sure. for me. <laughs> uh, I don't feel as superior, like, analyzing this <laughs> map. Uh, okay. Uh, ono što je ovdje nama primjetno u svadne oba plakata jeste dominantna figura Britanca ili čovjeka koji predstavlja Britaniju. Prvenstveno je na njima ovaj, ljudski lik za razliku od Rusije, recimo, koja ima izgled medvjeda, bez obzira što, što je simbolika neka ovaj, korištena, ali ipak Britančeva veličina je onako dominantna. Pa ne, mislim, čak uh, dominacija figure u stvari ukazuje da, da ovaj, uh, mapa ima to britansko porijeklo. I osim što je, znači, dominantna i očigledno ono, superiorna britanska politika, business as usual, ono, sređivanja svjetskih poslova i, i ovaj, igranja yeah. dominantnog arbitra, ovaj, yes. koji, ko, koji vrlo često koristi silu, 
bez ikakvog, bez ikakve hipokrizije, je li, pretvaranja. I možda na drugom plakatu, u stvari da je Njemečka, da ovdje ima prostora za neku njemečku propagandu u smislu straha od okruženja i predstavljanja sebe kao potpune žrtve. E, da, da, recimo na prvom plakatu su Rusi definitivno predimenzionirani, to je njihova snaga je ovaj, predimenzionirana u odnosu na ove njemečke psiće koji do duše laju, ali ne izgledaju nešto pretirano opasno. Mislim u stvari da je, da je veličina generalno ovih veličina e, aktera možda direktno povezana sa, sa silom koju raspolažu i subjektivitetom. <laughs> e, that would be all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Group over there. Ovako, prva, prva karikatura. E, Najbolje smo se složili da prikazuje da Britanija apsolutno ima najznačajniju ulogu u, u ovom ratnom sukobu. S jedne strane, s druge strane, da će se rat brzo završiti. Uvijek je to neko naše viđenje bilo, jer je Nemačka i Austrija su okružene sa svih strana i za leđenje ide ovaj ruski parni valja kao koji će ih otprilike pregaziti, a ovamo su kao e, neki, ako mogu, mogu da prepoznam, neki britanski buldog otprilike i vidi se da Britanac drži gospodari sa, s ratnom vodnaricom otprilike da, da će se taj suku brzo rešiti, a druga karikatura negde, negde postavlja ono što na neki utisak bio ovaj, pre svega ove, ove države koje su trenutno neutralne kao neki posmatrači a s druge strane već da, da, kao, da taj rat daje, daje neke efekte da se ide ka nekoj pobedi jer je uh, ovdje predstavljena Austrija kao već je na koradima sa svih strana napadnuta, negdje se pridržava za, za Nemačkog orla kao simbol, simbol Nemačkog carstva. To je to neka, neka, na kako smo mi uh, vidjeli to da će rad brzo da se završi. Krupa the back. Like to have a vote. Uh, so on the first picture, for me was the most impressive this big machine of Russia, but uh, this is perhaps due that I grew up in Germany after the war, and there had been a constant fear that Russia would go on, and that the, all these promises from the United States and whatever uh, wouldn't protect us. But the second impressive and the only uh, human being uh, is Britain. And uh, they for sure have been thinking that this would go on over quickly and that this dog there in, in Germany wouldn't be that uh, successful. And uh, on this second picture, yeah, Britain is doing like always, but there is still this fear from uh, the Russian side and uh, those uh, beings now are mainly civilians and they don't have a big chance against the spear, I would say. That's the, more or less the, what I think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, very and briefly, I think you've all picked up a lot of interesting things. I think you could see where that tool, that analytical tool that Stephen was talking about, where you could zoom in on different bits of it, would, would be very useful here with students. Um, I mean, one thing I would also pick up on in the first one, hark, hark, the dogs do bark, is actually the British are hedging their bets. They're not sure here. That bulldog has got two feet still in Britain. And what it's saying to you really, as a, speak, looking at that as someone who's British, is we rely on our Navy to do this rather than get too involved on the mainland. Um, but I would come up with basically two interpretations from the, the German point of view. I'm sure there are more, but um, one of them is the most obvious one, that this is good propaganda for us because we're the victims here in both cases. Um, and look at the Russians. They've got 
in one case they've got a steamroller, they've got a bear, and they've also got the Cossacks as well. I mean, we're really under attack here. So you can see where they would find that useful. But in fact, another interpretation which I've come across, and, and this is the Imperial War Museum in London, interprets it this way, which is that this is counter-propaganda, counter that this is see how the British tell each other about the war and our position in the war. So it's, so it's a second way of looking at it. But would you use things like this in the classroom, those of you who are teachers? Yeah. Uh, we've got a lot more. <laughs> um, and very, very quickly, homework, although you don't have to bring it back with you. Um, but that whole issue of who was to blame. Uh, and a, quite a nice quote here from Jay Winter, the American historian, that even now, 100 years later, the jury is still out. Um, the trial has yet to be concluded, as he says, about who was responsible. Um, but what we would suggest, and one of the things that had we talked less and given you more time, is to give you a few examples of historians offering different interpretations of who was responsible for the war and analyzing those. And the question we were going to ask you is, how would you use them in the classroom? What would you do to get the students to look at these different perspectives on the responsibility for the war? But well, we're out of time. Uh, perhaps you would email us with your answers. We would find that very welcome. And one last point I want to make is, at the risk of sounding like a vampire, we need new blood on Historiana. If you want to be contributors, please let us know, because we want material. And we want material from as many countries as we can, as we can get. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I have a sentence still? Um, I 